I see we have some curious little one here who says, what's in your basket? What's in my basket is all about the children's story. I want to tell you about a family. There was a mommy and a daddy. There was a girl named Esther. She was the oldest. She was 10. Then there was Samuel. Samuel was only eight. Then they had the little sister, and that was Sarah, and she was six. This family had something that they liked to do together. It was their special thing they did as a family every year. Every year they looked forward to it. Can you guess what it might be? Going to church. Oh, going to church. They love that. They did this only once a year. What could it be? It comes usually late in the summer. Many people might go to this event and see lots of things there. Come back like when you're done with all that big trips. Yeah, excellent. He's thinking of Journey to the Cross or Journey to Bethlehem. They would love that too, but not that. What were you thinking? You might there. Going to a restaurant. That's another good idea that families do together. But no, this place you might see people. You might see things, and you might see animals. Yes, very close to the zoo. It's the fair. Yes, the whole family loves to go to the fair. Do you know mommy's favorite thing was to see the quilts that the other ladies made? Daddy's favorite thing was to go see the cows and the tractors, of course. Yeah, but do you know that Aunt Esther's favorite thing? She liked to see the ponies. Sam's favorite thing. The piglets, they were so cute. Anyways, and do you know little Sarah's favorite thing? The little lamb. They like to pet them and touch them. But there was one thing that this family loved to do together as a family, and they look forward to it every year. Every year, they all, oh, let's go and do it. Can we do it now? Can we? Can we? What do you think that would be? Yes. What do you think it was that the whole family did together at the fair? See the horses? What else? They made something. What? A quilt. A quilt. Oh, he's so, so good. No, they weren't able to. I'm going to go ahead and show you. They had a special booth just for kids and families to do together. Sand art. So each of the children could make something all by themselves. And you know, who made the sand? Jesus made the sand, right. So the family all got together. Here's a bigger picture. Do you want to pass that around? They would make bottles of sand art. So when they went home after the fair, there on their dressers, they could see all the bottles of sand art that they made together as a family. Yeah. You've made, like, bottles of those. And you've made bottles of those, exactly like little bottles. Do you want to pass it along and you can look? Well, one year, mom and dad were so excited because at Christmas they were shopping for presents. What do you think they found? They found a kit of sand art, just like that, but bigger. There were six bottles in that kit, and they were so excited because they knew how much the family loved doing it together at the fair. So that year for Christmas, they gave it to the oldest daughter, Esther. Christmas came and everyone was so excited and Esther opened <gasps> Oh, the whole family was quiet because everyone was so excited. Now they could do something they loved together at home. But it was Sarah's present, uh, excuse me, Esther's present. And she opened it up and she counted, oh, there's six bottles. And she looked at her brother and sister and she immediately gave one bottle to her sister, Sarah. Sarah was so happy. She hugged the bottle. Yay! Sam came over and he said, Esther, Esther, can I have a bottle too? She looked at her bottle. Wow, she only had five now. No, I don't think so, Sam. Oh, poor Sam. He couldn't understand. He was so sad. What is he going to do? So he went over to Daddy and he said, Daddy, it's not fair. It isn't fair. She gave a bottle to Sister and, and she's got plenty and she's not giving one to me. And Daddy said, Son, I understand. 
but this was a gift for Esther. So it's Esther's choice what she's going to do with them. It's not our choice, and it may not seem fair, but you know, there's many things in this world that are not fair. And we all have to make decisions with how we live. So I'll go talk to sister for you. So daddy calls over sister Esther. So Esther, are you excited about your gift? Oh, yes, daddy. I noticed you gave one to your sister Esther, or Sarah, excuse me. Sarah is so happy. That was such a nice and generous thing for, Sarah, for you to do for Sarah. See how happy she is? But what about Brother Sam? He would like one too. But Dad, Dad, I only have five. And I wanted to make one for my teacher, and I wanted to make one for the pastor, and one for Grandma, and one for Grandpa. I would only have one left for myself. I can't give one to Sam. See, I'm caring and being generous to other people. And Dad said, I, I understand what you're thinking, but remember Esther in the Bible, when God talks about he created the world? And in Matthew, we read, it's in Matthew 6, verse uh, 21. We read where Matthew talks about where we put our treasures. Like our, our little bottles of sand art. Those are our family treasures. Where we put all of our our thinking, all of our love and our treasures, that's where your heart will be. Is that the kind of world you want to live in? I mean, it's your choice, but I want you to think about it. Esther, what kind of world do you want to live in? Do you want to live in a world where you have the right to keep all the stuff to yourself? Or do you want to live in a world where other people will share? But I want you to think about it, because your decision you make now will be setting the world you live in. So that means I'll have to tell your sister and brother that you've decided not to live in a sharing world. So that means they have extra some probably shouldn't share it with you. So I just want you to take some time now and think about it. What kind of world do you want to live in? Because it's your choice. What kind of world do we all want to live in? Esther was so sad, and she goes, OK, Daddy. And she went to her room, and she thought about it. And she looked at her Bible, and she prayed. And it was only a couple of minutes, just like you, Caleb. And she came back, and she said, Daddy, I want to live in a sharing world. I want to live in a world where we share with each other. Daddy hugged her. He said, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you, Esther. And so Esther went, and she took a bottle, and she gave it to her brother, Sam, who gave her a hug. So I want you to remember now, it's all of our choice. What kind of world do we want to live in? It's your choice. It's my choice. It's everyone else's choice. How do we behave does make a difference and helps us see what kind of world we're going to live in. So now every time you see sand or sand art bottles, I want you to think about what kind of a world do I want to live in, a world of sharing or not. So thank you now. You may all go back to your seat. God, we look to you. We turn to you with our whole hearts right now, Father. We pray that you have received our worship and that you've been blessed. We wish to continue in the attitude of worship as we now get into your word and consider what you might be speaking into our hearts. Bless this time that we have together. Pray that I would be removed and that you would be evident in this place. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor David Crockett is who I first observed giving a children's quiz before his sermons. I was a student at Walla Walla, and uh, he had recently become the pastor of Yakima, where I'm from, and we had... Uh, we would travel back to Yakima quite often and, and go to church where we became Seventh-day Adventists. And uh, I first saw Pastor Crockett uh, giving a children's quiz, and I, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And um, I've done it ever since. Uh, he went from Yakima and became a pastor up in Alaska um, for all 11 people that live up there. And then um, uh, was there for a few years, 
and then came down to Oregon. And he's now back in our conference in Lewiston. So I had a chance to see him uh, at some pastor's meetings just a few days ago. And I, I was able to say to him, I said, do you remember me? He says, oh, yes, I remember you were a student at Walla Walla. And we had a nice conversation. And I said, do you know? Uh, I, I asked him, do you still give quizzes before your, your sermon? He says, every one. I always do. And I said, did you know that I, I stole that from you? I, I do the same thing. He said, really? I said, I do. I, I love doing it. And I, I think it's a great thing. And so it was just great to see Pastor uh, David Crockett. And uh, I think he's going to be great down there at Lewiston. We got a, a lot of great uh, pastors in this conference. Um, I actually uh, uh, was able to uh, put together a PowerPoint and some sermon notes uh, because I just don't really have enough to do during the week. So I just uh, decided to uh, uh, go ahead and throw this in. So I, I have a quiz. It's in, in your, in your uh, bulletins. This is for the kids, of course. And I, I put them on the screen as well so uh, we could all follow along. I, again, I, I really want all the kids to participate. If you're in the balcony, raise your hand. I'll certainly try to call on you. I do ask that you uh, raise your hand so that we can uh, uh, hear what you have to say. Question number one. Who was the first uh, convert to Jesus after his baptism? Who, who first kind of recognized this? This is the Messiah. I really want to follow him. I'm, I, I want to be his disciple. Who was that? You know, I even gave you the scripture verses so you could look it up if you want to do that. Any of the kids? Okay, Akiah. <laughs> he said, okay, mom, who is it? <laughs> Ooh, the pressure's on, Denise. Go ahead and guess. Philip is a good answer. Philip is a good answer, but it's not the one that we read about uh, uh, first there in John chapter 1. Okay, Giselle, right here on the front. Andrew, how did you know that? That's amazing. Good job. Yeah, and again, uh, uh, there may have been others, but the first one that's named by name is, is Peter's brother. We often think of Peter being the first disciple, and he may have been because the stories, there are multiple stories of occasions where Jesus gives a call to his disciples. But in the Gospel of John, it, we hear the story of one who heard John speak and followed after him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And Andrew comes to, to Peter, his brother, Simon, and says to him, we have found the Messiah. He's, he's accepted that Jesus is the Messiah. So at least from John's perspective, Andrew, uh, which is a Greek name, by the way, um, meaning the man, how would you like that? The man. Uh, uh, we have found the Messiah. So who was then the last convert to Jesus before his death? Talk about who probably was the first, but who was the last one to really put his, his heart into the hands of Jesus and, and, and call him his Lord and uh, make him... Oh, oh, uh, Toby, your, your hand is being waved for you. Yes. The thief on the cross. Very good. You remember that story, don't you? The last convert that we might say before Jesus dies, the thief or the criminal, your Bibles might say, and I, I just put the verse on the screen here. He said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What a powerful story. As he's dying himself, as he is suffering in agony, he, he looks over to Jesus. And of course, Jesus, truly I say to you today, I move the comma, I move the comma, okay? Truly I say to you today, you shall be with me in paradise. Comma was not inspired. Okay, the words are inspired. and We could uh, talk about that. Okay, number three, moving a little quickly. They, someone mentioned Philip. Um, Philip was a, a powerful uh, minister for Jesus Christ, and he had the opportunity to, to be involved in someone's conversion to Jesus. Who was converted to Jesus after Philip preached Jesus to him? Who was that individual? It's there in the book of Acts. Any of you kids know? This is a great story, too. I love this story. Okay, I see uh, uh, Kalel's raising his hand. <laughs> wow, you guys started him early, didn't you? Am I missing anyone? Come on now. Timry? What? The eunuch. The eunuch, that's a big word, isn't it? I just called him the Ethiopian. You parents can explain to your kids the whole eunuch thing later if you want. The Ethiopian. 
Okay, and I, I, again, I, I put the verse up here because then Philip opened his mouth and began, uh, from the scripture, he preached Jesus to him. Isn't that, isn't that great? He preached Jesus. They went along the road and then came to water. He opened and said, look, water. What, what prevents me from being baptized? And, and of course, we know the story that he is baptized and he goes on his way rejoicing. So it's a great story of conversion. All right, one that we might know a little better. Who was converted on the road to Damascus? It's all about converts, as you see. Who was converted on the road to Damascus? Is that Aiden? I don't know. I see the nose and some fingers sticking up. Aiden, is that you? Okay, who was converted on this way to Damascus? Saul. That's right. Saul, whose name uh, we, we more often refer to as Paul. His Hebrew name was Saul. His Greek name was Paul. And uh, another powerful story, one of those remarkable, uh, you know, lightning and, and, and thunder and... Uh, 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 he falls to the ground, and, and he hears the voice saying, why are you persecuting me? He says, who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus, who you're persecuting. Uh, but get up and into the city to be told what you must do. This is kind of the beginning of his conversion and a, a powerful moment in his life that, that we're familiar with, obviously. All right, last one. Who was converted to Jesus after acting like an animal? And if you're in my Sabbath school class, you know this one because we just talked about it. Okay, make sure everyone gets a chance. Okay, I, I'm going to, Bailey hasn't had a chance yet. Bailey? Ne, yeah, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, you got to spell it though in order for it to count. Love, love the Bible names. What's the name of your baby? Oh, this is little baby Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, yeah, it's a great story there in the book of Daniel as he uh, comes out of his insanity that he was struck with and he, he gives homage to God and I praise, exalt, honor the king for all his works are true, his ways just. He's able to humble those who walk in pride. So we have an Old Testament example here as well of those who were converted to Jesus Christ. And that, that kind of is uh, part of my topic today that I want to share with you, this issue of conviction and conversion. Is there a difference? Is it possible to be deeply convicted of something, but believing that it's true, but not allowing that truth to change you? Uh, we, we recognize that. Now, we know that in a very cerebral way. We know that in a very mental way. But I think we often forget that sometimes in our lives. And we are satisfied with conviction, uh, not realizing that really conviction short of allowing that conviction to change you can actually be a dangerous thing. Um, uh, just to, some quick definitions here uh, for those of you who, who like uh, to understand words and vocabulary. Conviction uh, in its uh, religious sense, we might say, is just a, a firmly, deeply held idea, opinion, thought, principle, faith. It's just something that you, you feel strongly about. This is my conviction. Okay? Conversion is really a whole different thing. It's, it's a, a process. It's the act process or result of changing from one form, status, uh, or belief to another. Conversion is change. Conversion is changed. Just having conviction doesn't mean you've been changed by it, does it? We want to have uh, conversion as well as conviction, don't we? Come to a passage here. Uh, if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to open to Titus. It's just three short chapters. I wish we had time. It's a great book. It's one of the pastoral books of Paul. Uh, we're just going to look at a couple of verses and refer to a few others here in the book of Titus. As I, I like how Paul illustrates this in, in just a few words here in the book of Titus. Um, and, and we could look other places in, in Scripture as well. As this is a, a very significant theme in Scripture, obviously, but uh, Titus chapter 3. And we're going to be going to verse 3 as well. And here's how it, it says it here in verse 3. For we also once were. Now, what's the meaning of were? It's past tense. We are no longer. 
We were these things. We were foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. It's not a very pleasant thought, is it? That's not how we like to think of ourselves, is it? Is that you? No, no, I, I would never. No. Paul's not talking about me. I mean, he must be talking about how people were back then. But we've evolved, right? We've matured. We've become more civilized as a, as a society. We no longer behave like that. We're different, right? Who is Paul referring to here? He's, re Paul, he's, re re he's referring to the human condition, okay? I like to, uh, to say, uh, you Cretans, you've heard that before, Cretan? Is that generally a positive thing? No, it's a negative thing. And, and it just so happens that Paul is writing to Titus, who's on the Isle of Crete, that's where he is. And actually, that term comes back to, again, if you have your Bibles open to Titus uh, chapter 1, the, the, the Cretans, that's even funny to say, the Cretans had a reputation of being these type of people, okay? Titus uh, chapter 1, um, uh, verses 12 and 13, it says, uh, one of themselves, he's talking about the uh, Jews on Crete, a prophet of their own said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. They had a reputation. That's what the Cretans are. Lazy, evil, liars. And then the very next verse, now don't be confused by this, but Paul says, this testimony is true. <laughs> He's not saying the testimony about what the prophets are saying is true. He's saying what I'm telling you about what they say is true. Okay, do you understand the difference? He's saying that what, you, what people are saying about uh, what this prophet is saying, uh, you can believe that I'm telling you that he's saying this. For this reason, reprove them severely so that they may be sound in the faith. Come now down to verse 16. I just want you to see this in, in, uh, in the book of Titus. Um, he says, they profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. How would you like to have a pastor like that? This is Paul the pastor writing to, to Titus. He doesn't, he doesn't pull any punch, uh, punches here. He, uh, he, he wants people to understand their situation. This is not a happy thought. We also, I just want to go through these for a second. We also once were foolish. Have you ever been foolish before? Now, we sometimes use foolish in kind of a funny sense, right? Oh, that was so foolish, you know. I made a silly mistake. Oh, that was foolish. It's not what foolish means in the Bible. F foolish means a, a, a humiliating experience, something that you don't relate with a, a funny ha-ha, but something you don't ever tell anybody. When I was uh, growing up and going to my grandparents' house, they used to have a subscription to Country Magazine. You familiar with Country? Anyone? Come on now, Country Magazine. Yeah, admit it. You know you love it. It's all about farmers and, and uh, uh, beautiful scenery. And I remember liking it because there was one section in Country Magazine called My Most Embarrassing Moment. And it was almost always grandparents writing about how their grandchildren said something embarrassing while they were out in the community. And they were all, always funny. And, and uh, I remember thinking, uh, even back then as a child, if it's embarrassing yet you can tell others, it probably wasn't that embarrassing. You know what I mean? True embarrassment, true humiliation is when it happens, maybe 10, maybe 20, maybe 50 years later, you might tell your closest friends. But you don't ever want anyone to know but that what happened there. That's the kind of foolishness that this refers to. Have you ever been a fool? I have. I have been a fool at times. Disobedient. Kids. Well, we always think it refers to children. Have you ever been disobedient as an adult? Well, you're, you're an honest bunch here this morning, most of you. Very good. Deceived. Deceived. Now, again, we, we must understand there's innocent deception where you were honestly trying to know the truth, but you got led astray by something. And then there's the willful deception. Okay, Eve in the Garden of Eden was not an innocent deception. God had said, don't eat it. She knew that. Okay, that was understood, and she allowed herself to be deceived, and she ate it. Do you understand the difference? 
It wasn't like God hadn't articulated that yet and she didn't know. Although some have theorized that because the instruction was given to Adam. It was Adam's job to uh, disseminate that to his family. But you understand the difference. This is willful deception. Enslaved. I'm not a slave. Are you a slave? This isn't just the Cretans 2,000 years ago. This is what we struggle with today, isn't it? Enslaved various lusts and pleasures. Boy, we are a hedonistic society today, aren't we? Anything that uh, uh, we can experience as far as pleasure and lust, we just we race to as a society, and it's not outside the church. Malicious and envious. Well, those are hard things to admit. Hateful. Hateful. You know what it means to hate someone? It means to wish evil. It means to wish evil upon them. Ultimately, it means to wish they were dead. That's a very, very scary thought, isn't it? Yet we slip into this so, so much. And I, I know I've driven with people who uh, they, just, they just about wished everyone on the road but them was dead. You know what I'm talking about. You're in a hurry, they're in a hurry, and, and just someone just simply in front of you pauses to make a left-hand turn, and it's, oh, my goodness, I'm in a hurry. What are you doing? Don't you know how to drive? It's, really? My goodness. Uh, that's part of the enslavement uh, issue, too, isn't it? And then hating one another. This is, uh, this is not a, a happy thought to think that removed from the grace of God, this is who we are. Now, I, uh, uh, I, I hesitated to, to use this illustration this morning because uh, it's a little edgy. It's a little provocative. But I, I prayed about it, and I really, uh, I really feel strongly that it, it, it is an appropriate illustration. You know, it's not just us in the church who are uh, uh, struggling to, to come to the conclusion that apart from Jesus Christ, uh, this is the natural inclination of the human heart. Um, I guess this, the easiest way is just to lead up to it. Um, can the prob problem really be in me? Am I really the problem? Do I need to change? Am I at fault? Am I to blame for my own sins? Uh, about a year and a half ago, an, an Irish music group, uh, or a musician, I guess you could say, he has a group, but he's known by himself, by, by the name of Hosier, re, uh, released a song, and it went to the, the British Isles in, in Ireland, was very popular, very popular, went high in the charts in England, and it didn't cross the ocean and come over to the United States until earlier, earlier last year. And um, as soon as it hit the, uh, the United States music market, it immediately was a huge success. Race to the top of the charts. It was number three in March. Uh, continued to be very, very uh, influential and interesting uh, in pop culture throughout our society. It was uh, very, very uh, popular uh, throughout the summer. Uh, and then in the fall, it began to actually be played uh, in commercials and, and uh, uh, as background music for, uh, for shows and things like that. And that's where I first interacted with this song. And the reason why it caught my attention is because the name of the song is Take Me to Church. How many of you know what song I'm talking about? And I've talked to people about this song. Yeah, even some of you uh, 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 up in, in the balcony, I, I, I've talked to them and said, hey, have you heard that song? Oh, yeah. And for the most part, and I'm not speaking to anyone here uh, personally today, I've said, have you ever actually read the lyrics? No, I don't really know what it's saying, but boy, it's a fun song. It's a good song. I like the song. Very contemporary. And, you know, yeah, take me to church. Well, I, I actually, I hope this is okay. I was very interested in a song that is just sweeping the nation. It was on live television in December. It was number two on the charts in December uh, of, of last year, just a few weeks ago. And uh, I wanted to know about a song about take me to church that everyone loves, right? So I looked up the lyrics. And I'm going to share a few with you. Uh, it, it was really surprising. And, and I've actually done a little bit more research on this uh, that I'll share with you. If the heavens ever did speak, heavens, you know, God, if heavens ever did speak, which uh, you're saying they really don't, but if they did, she's the last true mouthpiece. 
Every Sunday's getting more bleak. What's that a reference to? Church. This church is not a happy place in this song. A fresh poisoned each week. We were born sick. You heard them say it. We were born sick. You heard them say it. And and there's a tendency sometimes uh, for the church. This is not necessarily just a, a an angry individual who has some some accusation that's unfounded. There's been a tendency in the church to have this uh, this message. Oh, you rotten sinner! You just you're a re, you know you've got issues. You're rebellious against God. You're a worm. Uh, by the way, what's the difference between uh, a godly guilt, godly sorrow? and guilt that comes from Satan. What's the difference? I think you all are right. I don't know what you said. Sounded good. It's really a quite simple concept. When you feel a sense of guilt with no way of escape, with no salvation, if, if you just sense you're a worm, you're born a worm, you're, 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 you're a liar, you're a cheater, you're, you're worthless, there's nothing to you, you were born a worm, you are a worm, you'll die a worm, That is not the message of God, is it? Now, we need to know the truth about our status. And sometimes guilt comes to us in the form of, yes, you made a mistake. Yes, you went the wrong way. Yes, you hurt yourself. You hurt others. You hurt God. But mercy is available. The cross is for you. That is godly guilt. This person missed that message. And I dare say it that sometimes we in the church have failed to make that message clear. Uh, Just a couple more. I was born sick, but I love it. And then this term, command me to be well, is actually a a, a mocking term. It's often attributed to the uh, the, the late atheist Christopher uh, Hitchens, who who died in 2011, a very, very intellectual uh, uh, atheist who, who rallied against religion, rallied against the church. He was known in a lot of his debates. He, he debated Tony Blair uh, in England, if any of you are familiar with that. And, and un- unfortunately, Tony Blair didn't do a very good job for faith and religion. And Hitchens uh, kind of took him behind the woodshed. But um, he's known for co- using this phrase, uh, uh, we were born sick yet commanded to be well. And it's this way of, of saying, it's not fair. How dare you say that God made us one way, but then he kind of wags his finger at us and says, now you need to be another way. And it's actually, uh, uh, it actually goes back uh, hundreds of years to an English poet uh, named Fulke uh, Greville, Baron Brook Fulke Greville, um, who in his diatribe against Calvinism first said this in one of his poems. We were born sick, yet commanded to be well. This is part of the lyrics of the song. This is the last part of it. No masters or kings, when the ritual begins, there is no sweeter innocence than our gentle sin. This is just a part of it. This is just a part of it. Now, again, I realize that not everyone listening to this song and appreciating this song and liking this song all across America, all across Europe, are all delving into the lyrics to this same depth. I remember when I was growing up, one of the songs we used to sing in church is when the roll is called up yonder. You know that? For years and years, I had no idea what a roll was, nor why we were calling it a beyonder. Not up yonder. I was calling the roll a beyonder. Didn't know what a beyonder was and had no idea what a roll was. But I loved it and I was singing it. You know what I'm saying? So people can appreciate the song and like the song, not necessarily agreeing with the message. But once you understand the message, it, it, it really made me weep. It really made me weep. And this represents a large, significant part of what people in this country view religion as. This is how they view religion. How they view particularly Christianity. I was uh, listening to an interview where the uh, artist was describing the song, and he said, you know, the song really isn't an indictment of religion or the church. And he goes, well, yeah, actually it is. Actually it is. He couldn't escape the fact that that was the motivating factor of him writing the song. It was an indictment against the church. And, and you can do some of your own research to learn more about that if you, if you want. We were born sick. Sickness and healing. I thought this was a, a fitting illustration of, uh, of, of how we can look at this situation. And it comes to the, uh, uh, to the early development of germ theory. Uh, 
uh, germ theory. In the early days, in the early development of hospitals and, and group care facilities, they noticed that just about everyone uh, in a hospital, they were all kind of catching the same disease, often not the disease they came in with. And they were trying to figure out, why is this happening? How does this work? What is the factors? They didn't know about bacteria. They didn't know about viruses. They didn't know about microorganisms and germs and that type of thing. That wasn't part of their understanding. They didn't know that. But they, wanted, they really wanted to help people. So they would bring people in the hospitals, and everyone in the hospital would catch the same thing. And the the mortality rate uh, skyrocketed. By the way, I feel particularly terrible about the women that had to uh, suffer at the hands of early doctors. Uh, You know, the women that have the babies, right? And then have uh, the other challenges that required often the services of a doctor who did not know a thing about what they were doing. And the mortality rate among women in hospitals was just skyrocketing. But doctors, they wanted to know, so they began to do experiments. And they would isolate patients at hospitals and at clinics and at, at group care facilities, and they would, they would separate them, and they would say, okay, this one came in with this disease, this one came in with this disease, but we're going to keep them separate. And this one's going to have different water, different food, different, uh, different air, and this one's going to have different water, air, different nurses, different staff, and come to find out, both of them would get sick again. And the doctors began to look at it and say, what is the only common factor that can possibly be transmitting this disease? They didn't understand. They thought disease was in the air and in, 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 in other things. And finally, a few very brave doctors, when they were looking at this, and this is before Louis Pasteur, they started looking around, then they started looking at themselves. They looked at the blood on their hands. They looked at at the instruments that they would take using from one patient to the the other. And that was the only factor that they could determine was the commonality between the patients. One of the early things that, that doctors do, they would go right from an autopsy, right from an autopsy to treat a patient with no washing, no cleansing, no anything. And the rate of disease was just awful. But a few brave doctors finally determined, we're the problem. We're the problem. The problem is us. The very people that we're trying to help, we are hurting. Now, uh, the, the, the medical community is well known for being very humble, very open, very willing to accept new ideas, right? That, no, no. How well do you think this went over in the 19th century? Doctors hated the idea. And there was a particular doctor, um, a Hungarian by the name of Simmelweis, who became very adamant. Uh, He was washing his hands. He was cleansing his instruments. He was requiring his staff to wash their hands as well. He was a quack. The medical community called him a quack. And he said, but look, my patients are alive. Your patients are dead. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, he he wrote letters. He he eventually started uh, accusing the medical community of being murderers. And he did in his letters. He said, you, knowing what we know now, if you continue in this practice, you are responsible for the death of people that you treat. How much bravery does it take to admit that the problem is here? The problem is here. That's somewhat what we have to face as Christians. We may not like it, but until we change our practice, what would it be like for a doctor to realize, yes, the blood on my hands and and all of the material that I've been working with, I understand that it transmits disease, but I'm not changing. I'm going to continue to treat the same way. I'm not going to change. That's conviction without conversion. And there's a spiritual aspect of this as well. Does Christ command us to be well, but do nothing to help us? Great transition statements in Scripture. Paul just goes through this list. You once were were foolish and disobedient, hateful, and all those malicious, all those things. But then he says, but. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. Amen? 
He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in the righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of the regeneration and the renewing by the Holy Spirit. He saved us by washing of regeneration and by renewing of the Holy Spirit. In the last few sermons, Jeff and I have both been really trying to emphasize the need of prayer, the need of the Holy Spirit, the need of washing, the need of purity. But we need conversion, not just conviction. We need conversion. Conviction of the truth is not the same as conversion. God does not want us just to be convinced that he is our God and Savior. He wants us to change, and he helps us to change. He makes us into new creation. Part of the problem of our evangelistic meeting programs that we do, and, and, and God blesses them. I, I know I'm not. We've done many of them in this church and in this community, and we've seen the benefit of that. But just part of the problem is that they were developed in a time when the vast majority of people either had some basic relationship with God or had some basic appreciation for truth, and they just needed more uh, uh, guidance, more truth, more knowledge. We weren't necessarily trying to make converts. We were trying to bring in new convictions so that they could grow in their conversion experience. Is that okay? Is that fair? Is that allowed? Part of the problem now is when we have a lot of our evangelistic meetings where there's uh, people who are, are uh, invited to come and they come, they have not experienced any level of conversion, and we end up making convicts without making them converts. They're convicted of it. That sounds right. Sure seems like that Bible knows what it's saying. Sure looks about right about Jesus coming again. The signs are there. Sure seems like his law makes sense. Probably ought to do it. But they're not converted to Jesus Christ. It becomes a duty and an obligation. I got a little ahead of myself here. But I just, it's so important that we understand the difference. Today, most people we meet uh, uh, have a, a, a more basic uh, understanding of morality. So how do we know? This was an important thing. In, in, uh, in my message this morning. How do we know? Okay, pastor, I understand. I need to know. It needs to be beyond just believing the truth. It needs to be beyond just having convictions about certain things in my life and my relationship with God. But how do I really know when I'm converted? That's really the question, isn't it? That's what we need to know. What is that, that, uh, that line that we cross that we say, okay, uh, it's not just that I've been presented with truth, not that just I've accepted truth, but I have now taken that step to be changed by the truth. And really, as I begin to pray about this and, and, and get into the scriptures and get into the spirit of prophecy, it, it really is quite simple. The answer is love. The answer is love. And you, and you see these references on the screen. On the screen, One of the strongest effort, evidences of true conversion is love to God and man. That doesn't come from you. It certainly doesn't come from the enemy. It's evidence that the renewing power of the Holy Spirit has come into your life, and those who you would naturally be adverse to, those who you'd naturally uh, be deceived by, those who you'd naturally be hateful towards, you now love. You now love, and you love God. Show what is the fruit of conversion, the evidence that they love God. They love God. One more uh, passage here. It's a little bit longer. Conversion is a work that most do not appreciate. It's not a small matter to transform an earthly, sin-loving mind and bring it to, the un to understand the unspeakable love of Christ, the charms of his grace, the excellency of God, so that the soul shall be imbued with divine love, and captivated with the heavenly mysteries. You know when you've been converted to Jesus Christ, when your actions, your thoughts are motivated, your, your, your motivations are fueled by love, by love. Why do you go to church? It's my duty as a Christian. I'd feel guilty if I wasn't there. Amen. 
Yes, sir. Why do you keep Sabbath? Because it's in the law. I'd be a sinner if I didn't. That's right. You betcha. Why do you pay your tithes and offerings? Well, someone's got to keep the church running. Yep. It's needed. Why do you forgive those who offend you? It's the right thing to do. Mama told me, forgive those who offend you. It's the right thing to do. You betcha. That's right. Why do you pray for the sick? God says pray. He says pray. I do it because God says it. Do what God says. Why do you stand up for creationism in school? Because I believe in the Bible. I believe that Bible. It's a good thing, isn't it? Sure. Why do you eat the way you eat? Why do you dress the way you dress? Why do you act the way you act? Because God has asked me to. He wants me to be healthy. He wants me to make good decisions. He wants me to represent him in a, in a holy and, and, and wholesome manner. Why are you a Christian? Why are you a Christian? Because I was raised that way. Mom and dad were Christian. Grandma and grandpa were Christian. Came over on the boat. They were Christians when they came over on the boat. They were Christians when they died. Mom and dad's Christian. I'm a Christian because I was raised a Christian. These are good answers. These are honest answers. These are honest, candid truths and convictions. They're not wrong, but neither are they evidence of conversion. They're not evidence of conversion. When you can, in your heart of hearts, not in an obnoxious way, not in a Bible-thumping way, not in a, a proud way, but when your answer to all those questions is because I'm motivated by my deep love and sincerity for, the, for Jesus Christ and the grace with which he's poured out in my life. Then you know when it's honest with it, when in the integrity of your heart, that's the motivation. You are a converted individual. I go to church because I love the worship of God with my, with, my, uh, with my fellow believers. I would hate to miss it. And I love the work of Jesus Christ so much that I'm happy to give a portion of my tithes and offerings back to him. And I would never want to offend anyone. And I want to forgive people because I know how much Jesus has forgave me. And he said that we should love each other. And I do love people. That is evidence of the Holy Spirit change in your life. We need the love of God. And if the love of God had been operating, if the love of God had been evident, if the love of God had been first and foremost in the message of the church, I doubt that song would have ever been written. Every Sunday getting more bleak, new poison each week. <coughs> Not when we're operating out of love. Not when we understand what Jesus Christ truly is and what he means to us. When the love of God permeates our thoughts, our actions, our motives, our words, our minds, our hearts, we're moved beyond simple conviction and just experiencing true, true conversion. Are you converted today? Are you converted? Do you love people? Remember, hate is wishing evil upon someone. Love is wishing blessings upon people. Well, I was converted 25 years ago. Appreciated it then. Appreciate it now. And I'm still converted. After 25 years, that one time was a good thing. You know, some people talk about their marriages like that, you know. Put the handcuffs on 15 years ago. Still in shackles. We need to experience conversion every day. We need to experience conversion today. And we can experience conversion right now. Right now. There is a remedy. There is a remedy. There's a cure. It's Jesus Christ. It's His grace. It's you humbly acknowledging that you need Him. And you've erred. 
willing to accept his love.